Hello everyone, welcome to Santa Monica College's Registered Nursing Virtual Information Session. So let's go ahead and get started. So first off, I understand that this is a virtual information session, so you guys all might have questions and concerns about a lot of the information presented here. Uh, in case that you do, I just want to let you know that I'm one of the four health science counselors and we're scheduled Monday through Friday. So in the case that you want to clarify anything that you heard today, or if you have specific questions tailored to your transcripts and to your individual case, feel free to call the front desk or Michelle to schedule a health science counseling appointment. And again, we're available for you guys. Uh, online, so we can schedule an online Zoom video conference, a telephone appointment, or we could even communicate via email. Okay, so before we begin, I want to address where you can find a lot of the information that I'm going to talk about in today's session. So I'm going to escape out of here and show you where you can access all of this information. So I went to Google. So I think the easiest way to find things is just to type in SMC Health Sciences and to go right to our department website. This is the home page. And if you click over here to nursing, that will take you here. So you're going to be able to see application procedures, admissions process. And I want to point out here, is where you can get our informational flyer, which I think is really important. It's a really nice snapshot of the program, the criteria for admission, as well as just an idea of what the four semesters of the nursing program will look like. All of the prerequisites, so I'm gonna discuss that in great detail shortly. Graduation requirements, general ed requirements, cost of the program, etc. So I will be addressing again a lot of the information on here, so I think it's really important to know where this is. I'm also going to point out the nursing multi-criteria. So I know for some of you, you don't know if you're interested in the nursing program yet. You're just kind of coming here to get some general information. Some of you might be very far along in the process, already started your prerequisites. Some of you may have finished your prerequisites already. But I think what's important for all of you is just knowing what the criteria is for determining how the program will uh, choose students essentially for admissions purposes. So this is going to be included in the presentation today, but I also want to point out where it is so that way if you wanted to bookmark it or print it out for yourself for quick access, you can see what we call the multi-criteria admissions requirements. So again, I'm going to talk about it in greater detail, but I just wanted to show you where on the website you can get, I would say, the most key pieces of information. So again, just Google SMC Health Sciences and it'll take you to our nursing page and you can see where this is. Okay, so in the information session today, I'm going to show you a, a really quick video uh, from the Community College Chancellor's Office about nursing. We'll also talk about the prerequisite requirements, graduation requirements, give you an idea of the application timeline. So when we accept applications, uh, when you would be making an application appointment, what semesters you would be applying for. That leads us into everyone being uh, required essentially to take an admissions assessment test. So I know a lot of campuses want students to take something called the T's, which I'm sure is very familiar to anybody that's considering nursing. Here at SMC, we require the National League of Nursing, NLN PACS exam. So I'll go over that in quite a bit of detail. We'll also talk about the nursing courses, what the curriculum looks like at our campus specifically. And since this is a virtual uh, info session, we won't be doing a skills lab tour, but maybe that's something we can do for the future. So now I want to quickly play for you. I think this is a great video just to give you a snapshot of what it would be like uh, to be in a nursing program. OK, so just bear with me as this loads. The 
process of getting into a nursing program starts two years before you even get into the program. There's uh, numerous prerequisites that you have to take all before you can even apply. The time commitment to the nursing program is extreme. I was expecting it, but it really does change your life. One of the things that students consistently tell me that is surprising to them is the rigorous curriculum in the nursing program. The amount of reading required in the nursing program is above and beyond most programs at the college level. My biggest, My biggest thing that I always say about nursing is the skill you need is compassion. No, it's not a physical skill of being able to put an IV in an individual, but you have to have the love for people to be able to excel in the nursing field. My recommendation would be to start at a good community college because, first of all, you're going to save a lot of money. Because, because you can graduate, you can graduate sooner, sooner from a community, community college, college, you're going to get, get out there and start working, working sooner. sooner. The compassion that I've received from my professors is amazing. They are here because they want to see you achieve. I think the main takeaway from that video is that a major such as nursing, and not to scare you or overwhelm you, but it does require a huge commitment. So, for example, prerequisite coursework, exams, a formal application process, um, likely you'll be doing some volunteer work, and then once you're in the program, clinical training, there's licensure that you need to do after completing your education. So really it just means that nursing in particular, among all health science majors, requires a goal-oriented mindset and some motivation. Okay, so let's continue on. Okay, prerequisites. So before applying for the nursing program, there are at least four classes at minimum that one would need to do in order to be eligible for the nursing program. And those four classes are listed here in red. So every student must have at minimum an English composition course. It needs to be a college level reading and comp course. Here at SMC, it's referred to as English 1. At other schools, you might see it referred to as English 101 or English 1A if you have a bachelor's degree or attended another community college or university in state or out of state. It might have different uh, course numberings or course titles. As long as it's not a humanities course or a literature course, uh, and it's deemed equivalent to like a reading and composition course. And again, all of those details I know are very specific to each individual student. But I would say bottom line, a reading and composition course, you are good. Some students also take advanced placement, so AP exams in high school. So if you did, for example, um, AP English language or AP English literature with a score of three or higher, that could be used in lieu of an English one class as well. Uh, if you meet with us in a counseling appointment, we can go over all of the different subtleties and details regarding English 1. Now, moving on to the sciences. So we require three science courses for admission to the nursing program. I call them the big three, and that would be anatomy, physiology, and microbiology. I know at different campuses, um, some students may be taking a biology class before they take anatomy. If I speak specifically to Santa Monica College, the only prerequisite for Anatomy 1 is the English Composition course, the English 1 class. So students, again, would need to do Anatomy. Then followed by Anatomy, they would typically take a Chemistry. So even though Anatomy, Phys, and Micro, those three science courses are the minimum eligibility requirements, uh, you will actually be taking what we call these hidden prerequisites. So chemistry is a requirement in order to take any physiology course, typically. Um, so students have a choice between taking chemistry 10 or chemistry 19. Uh, your choice. Uh, personally, I like the chemistry 19 because that is a chemistry uh, specifically for health science students. So the chem is in health science context. If, for example, you take this chem class, you then cleared the prerequisite so that you can take physiology. Finally, microbiology. Now, some students take these courses in different orders. Some may take anatomy, then micro, and then chemistry, then physiology. Again, speak to one of us in order to determine the best course for you, the best plan, the best order, 
We have to also consider different variables like are you working? How many hours a week do you work? Uh, like what's your daily life like? What's What are your responsibilities? Do you have children? Do you have family responsibilities? Do you have an active social life? So all of these are something that you would want to take into consideration when planning in what order and how many classes you want to do everything. Um, but generally speaking, most students take one course at a time. So they may do anatomy first, followed by chemistry in a separate semester. Then they may do physiology, followed by microbiology. I think a lot of new students, upon seeing the prerequisites, they think, oh, you know, I want to be a full-time student. I think I could take, you know, 12 to 15, 16 units, and they think they can do all four of these courses at the same time. And that it's definitely not only not realistic, you might be very overwhelmed, but you couldn't anyway, simply because there are prerequisites in place. So again, you would do, be doing English first. Some students might do English and chemistry together, or English and other general ed requirements. They might do anatomy all by itself. It tends to require a lot of memorization and a lot of reading and time and dedication. And again, it's, I would say, a high stakes course. And we're going to get into this in terms of GPA, but we do calculate a GPA simply for the three science courses, anatomy, physiology, and micro. So again, the grades that you get in these courses are very important. We also look at uh, GPA for English. And again, I'll talk about all of this uh, when it comes to the multi-criteria. So you could see all of the different sections that we take into consideration when tabulating how many points you would get in each of these areas. Okay, so in addition to completing anatomy, physiology, and micro, there's a couple different rules that apply to these three sciences. So just to clarify, this does not include chemistry or biology or any other science for that matter. We look at anatomy, physiology, and microbiology for these rules. So you need to have a combined GPA of a 2.5 for anatomy, physiology, and microbiology. So rule number one, that means you cannot have less than a C for any of these three courses. So for example, just say you got an A in anatomy, a C minus in physiology, and a B in microbiology. That would make a student ineligible because you need to have a grade of C or better simply because these are the science prerequisites. Rule number two, you cannot have more than one repeat in any of these three core sciences within the last five years of your application to the nursing program. So I know that might sound confusing. So for example, just say you take anatomy and for whatever reason you have to withdraw from the class. That's okay. Um, then you take anatomy again and get a D. Then you take anatomy again and get an A. So you've just exhausted your one repeat since you got a D in anatomy and you repeated it. Then that same student takes physiology, gets an A. Awesome. Then that student takes microbiology after that and gets an F. They repeat that microbiology course and get an A. Technically, yes, they have a 4.0 GPA, but they've already used their one repeat within the last five years for the D in anatomy. So because they took microbiology and got an F in it, they've already used up their one repeat. That student is not eligible for the program. The exception to that is if you took any of these sciences more than five years ago. And this is the case for some students. Uh, some students might have taken anatomy, physiology, or microbiology more than five years ago. So just say in your case, you took micro in 2013 or 2014. Since that was more than five years ago from the year 2020, that course is expired. And because it's expired, we do not count that repeat um, as part of the one repeat um, that would be technically used against you. Rule number three, all science courses need to be completed within the last five years of the time of application. And again, to clarify, what we mean by science courses are the classes you see here, anatomy, physiology, and microbiology. We tend to get questions a lot like, I took a my chemistry class, that I took it six years ago, am I okay? You're okay since we, do, again, do not calculate a GPA for chemistry. 
we're looking solely at anatomy, physiology, and microbiology, a 2.5 GPA for those three courses. They need to be within the last five years. So that refers to what we call the recency rule. They have to be current. And no online labs. And I know that's really rare. I know for any of you who've attempted already and taken successfully anatomy, phys, or micro, it's almost impossible to do any of these labs online. But some schools do do online labs. We know who they are. Uh, and we do not accept online lab courses for any of the anatomy, physiology, or microbiology courses. And again, for the English prerequisite, I know I mentioned this already on the previous uh, slide, but you need to have a grade of C or better. I know it's very rare, but once in a while we may see a student who's attempted an English composition course that's college level, transferable, but they got a C minus in the course. That may have been okay for their campus, but for the nursing program, since English is a Board of Registered Nursing approved prerequisite course, that class needs to be a C or higher. And I know I referenced this again um, before, but an AP English language or AP English literature score of three or higher will also meet this requirement. I know this is a, a confusing slide, so if anyone has, again, any questions or wants clarity, especially for their specific transcript, or if you're attempting to take any courses at another community college or university outside of SMC, feel free to make an appointment with us um, so that we can talk with you guys about any of the courses that you've taken or plan to take. Okay, so I understand, and I see this all the time, students want to hurry up and finish those prerequisites so they can get ready to apply to the registered nursing program right away. They understand that, you know, it's going to take me a long time to apply to nursing programs. They're competitive. It, you know, it takes me at least two years to get through a program. So I want to blow through these prereqs as soon as possible. So usually in an in-person info session, I like to share the perspectives of the students that have already taken these science courses. And I would say in general, most students don't recommend taking any of the anatomy, phys, and micro classes during a short inner session like winter and summer, just because th those sessions essentially could be as short as six weeks or eight weeks. They go really fast. A regular semester is typically 16, 17 weeks. So you might be in a science course where it's going three times as fast. You might have an exam the first or second week. You're going through chapters of material all at once. And because GPA for the science courses are really important, not only for SMC, but any health science major out there, um, it's really important to make sure that you have the time commitment available to do a science course as rigorous as anatomy, physiology, or micro in a short intercession. So just take that into consideration when you're thinking about when to take your prerequisite courses. Also, I mentioned as an example on the previous slide, um, what if you withdraw from a course? So a withdrawal does not count as a repeat. So it doesn't prevent you from applying to the program if you have multiple withdrawals, but I will talk about how it does impact your points. So just to kind of give you a sneak peek, any withdrawal or any W on your transcript for anatomy, physiology, and micro within the last five years will result in three points being deducted from your overall point total. And again, I'll talk about this much more in detail shortly. Okay, so here's a little snapshot, a, a cheat sheet, so to speak, um, in terms of science prerequisites. So everything that you see here pretty much is A-OK. -okay. The exception to that would be any of the two GPA combinations in red towards the bottom. So if, for example, you're taking anatomy and you realize, you know, I might be getting a C in this class, that's not a problem. But if you foresee that during your physiology class that you're not doing as well and you're getting it perhaps a C in that, that's when you have to be a little bit more concerned simply because that last microbiology course might determine whether or not you're eligible for the program. So again, CCC or BCC or any combination thereof, um, if it results in a GPA of less than a 2.5, that student would be ineligible for the program. Okay, so nursing program uh, requirements and graduation requirements. So just to clarify, so you just need four prerequisites, like I mentioned, English, anatomy, physiology, and microbiology in order to apply to the nursing program. 
However, in order to sit for your licensing board. So after you finish uh, your nursing curriculum, you have to get licensed. In order to be licensed, you need to earn an associate's degree in nursing. So as part of the requirements for the nursing major, you need to have completed a human lifespan development from birth to death psychology class. I know some nursing programs require an intro to psychology class. That's great. I think if you have that as a foundation, you'll be that much stronger if you take a lifespan psychology course after that or along with that. But here at SMC, our requirement is a lifespan psych course. At the LA Community College District campuses, um, it's called Psych 41. Typically, if you've taken a lifespan human development birth to death class at a California community college, you should be a okay. The second nursing major requirement class is communication studies. So here at SMC, we allow you guys to do either course. You can do an interpersonal communication class or a public speaking class. Now, the only caveat to the public speaking course is that if you completed that class, I would say after 2013 summer, then you're okay. Our curriculum committee approved this course summer 2013. So for this particular course, the public speaking class, you would, you would have had to take that course after summer 13 in order for it to count. There's no time restriction on the communication studies 35. Now, right below that, um, you'll see four different categories of associate's degree general ed requirements. So these are the remainder of courses that you would need to earn your associate's degree in nursing. So again, four prerequisites, psychology and communications, and then these associate's degree GE requirements. And then finally, once you get into the program, you'll be taking four different semesters of nursing curriculum courses. So these classes, uh, humanities, social science group A, rationality, which is, you know, fancy for math and global citizenship. These are courses that you can take if you want to be a full-time student alongside your prerequisite. So we have sometimes have students taking, for example, their English class. They may, they may then along with that, take a math class. They may then also take a global citizenship class and maybe like a communications class if they want to be full time. It's really important to consider the balance and the load, whether you want to go part time or full time. And I invite you to make a, a counseling appointment just to figure out what would be the best educational plan for you guys to follow. So humanities and global citizenship, why there's a, a slash between those courses is global citizenship is a specific course that everyone needs for the associate's degree. Um, and it really implies that you're taking a class that covers, you know, either three US or three world cultures all in one class. There are some classes, however, that are designated global citizenship and humanities. So if you wanted to take, for example, one course to fulfill both categories, if you wanted to take a class that fulfilled both courses, uh, you could see the program of study for the nursing program. Uh, and you could see a list of courses that you could take that fulfills both of these courses. So it could be uh, a cultural music class or a cultural dance class, and it fulfills humanities and global citizenship. Again, I know confusing, so feel free to speak with us so we can clarify that for you. Social science group A, that's either a US history or a political science course. If you were to, for example, take History 10 or History 14, that fulfills both Social Science Group A and Global Citizenship all with one class. So that's something that I highly recommend um, just because you can get rid of the Global Citizenship requirement and Social Science, Social Science Group A in one class. So ideally, uh, we would recommend English 2 just because that would be a requirement. And I know this is into the future, but if you were thinking about getting a bachelor's degree in nursing, so a BSN, you ideally would want to take English 2, probably your History 10 or History 14 to fulfill your Social Science Group A and Global Citizenship, and finally, a statistics class that would fulfill um, the rationality requirement. Okay, so on your nursing brochure, which is that colorful sheet that I showed you, um, how you could access it from our nursing webpage, you can see in that curriculum that you could actually take nursing 36 and nursing 17 as part of your nursing curriculum when you were to start the program. So nursing 36 
is a class that's integrated into the first semester of the nursing program. Nursing 17, pharmacology, is integrated into the second semester of the nursing program. However, what's great is that students can take these courses even before being accepted into the nursing program. Now, do I recommend for you to take them while you're doing your prerequisites? Probably not. We have some students who've finished their prerequisites and are in the process of applying to the program and waiting to see if they're accepted. If that's the case and you kind of have an open semester, it's a perfect opportunity to take Nursing 36 and Nursing 17. Now, some students, if they're able to, they might even take, for example, one of these nursing courses like Nursing 36, perhaps while they're doing um, say microbiology. I know that could be a little bit overwhelming to do these courses uh, while you're doing your prerequisites, but again, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Every student is very unique and very individual, so we can work with you and talk with you to determine when you would want to take these nursing courses. For some students, it's a fit to take them after finishing their prerequisites and while they're waiting to get in. Some decide that they want to maximize the amount of points that they have before applying to the nursing program and they decide they want to take these even before applying. Some students decide, I want to apply immediately. I want to see if I get in and then I'll take these nursing 36 and 17 courses while I'm in the program. And again, there's no right or wrong answer. It's again, very individual to the student. So we can talk to you about. That. However, if you want to take a nursing 17 course, not to overwhelm you with information right now, but if you are coming to us from another community college outside of SMC or another college or university, you would need to get clearance from the life science department, specifically if you want to take the pharmacology course. So nursing counselors, we can clear you for classes like anatomy or English, but nursing 17 is under the purview of life sciences. And you could see here um, the information you would need to send specifically to this email, sciencewaivers at smc.edu. You would include your transcript, your course description and syllabi, because physiology is a hard prerequisite in order to take Nursing 17. So any student could take Nursing 17, whether you decide to take it online um, or on ground uh, at Santa Monica College. But again, you would need clearance before you're able to register in either of those sections. And here is a screenshot uh, from the Life Sciences Department if you wanted to get any waivers for any courses within the Life Sciences or Physical Sciences Department. You can basically Google um, SMC Life Sciences waivers and it would take you to this page here. Okay, so now I want to talk to you guys about the multi-criteria screening process. So I showed you where you can see this form on the website of the nursing page. Uh, and I'm going to refer to each of these sections one by one. Here at SMC, we do not do uh, a wait list or a lottery. We accept students based on how many points they have on the multi-criteria screening process. And all of these sections are very unique and different. And I know a lot of times students will be really concerned like, oh man, I don't have the best GPA, but I want to reassure you that it's not just numbers that help students be competitive for admission. You'll see different categories on the multi-criteria. For example, if you have an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, if you have life experiences, if you have health experience, if you speak a foreign language, these are all different areas that would help maximize your points. So I've seen a very different combination of applicants. They might have fantastic GPAs and they might not have points in other areas. So that may not make them the most competitive applicant. On the flip side, I might see students with a 2.9 or a 3.2 GPA and they're very competitive applicants because perhaps they're working in healthcare already. They've taken Nursing 36 and Nursing 17 and they're going to get extra points for that. Uh, for example, they've applied for an associate's degree because they've fulfilled all of their science prerequisites. Um, and a lot of times you might be eligible for an associate's degree in general sciences, even though you're not applying yet for the nursing program. So those are all things to, to consider. So let's go over everything one by one. So the first category is academic degrees. 
So we award points and up to five points for either an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. Some students ask if I have both, do I get 10 points? You do not. So these degrees need to be officially conferred on your official transcript. So what that means is that on your official transcript, when that transcript is sent to SMC admissions and it's uploaded for us to view, we're going to be able to see the date of that degree, your major, where it was conferred. And as long as it's a completed degree from a regionally accredited U.S. college or university, you will earn either five points for your associates or five points for your bachelor's degree. Now for foreign coursework, uh, we can award points to students who have the equivalent of a bachelor's degree as awarded from a regionally accredited college or university here. You need to have that foreign transcript evaluated and translated by one of the approved evaluation agencies. The official report needs to be on file and we need to be able to see that it's a degree. Again, if this applies to you, feel free to meet with us um, virtually uh, so that we can discuss with you all of the details about foreign evaluations, bachelor's degrees, etc. The second category is volunteer work and or relevant work experience. And there's three different tiers. So some of you might be licensed healthcare workers. And what I mean by that is maybe you're a licensed vocational nurse, you're an LVN or you are a licensed paramedic. If that's the case, you have licensure and you meet the work experience hours. So I know some students might have certification, they might have licensure, but they don't have actual work hours working um, at a facility or a site and you're being paid and employed. So you may not be able to access the points if you do not have the work experience hours alongside your licensure or certification. You also need to uh, submit a copy of your current license with your license number and expiration date in order to access the points. Same thing for certified healthcare worker. We have a lot of CNAs and home health aides and medical assistants and EMTs who apply to this program. So if, for example, you have between 500 and 749 hours of work experience as a CNA or a medical assistant, you'll get four points. And you could see the breakdown thereof. If you have more than a thousand hours, so if you've been working obviously more than a year full time as any of these certified healthcare workers, and you have current licensure to show, you will get eight points and you'd be maxed at eight points. Some students volunteer, and I think that's fantastic. So if you volunteer at Cedars or UCLA Clinical Care Extenders or the Cope Health Scholars Program, depending how many hours you have, if you have up to 499 hours, you'll have access to two points. And if you have more than 500 hours, you'll get four points. Other applicants might have other allied health uh, employment. So for example, if they're a unit-based clerical person in an ICU in a hospital, you might not be a nurse or an LVN or a CNA. Um, that could be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. So if you feel you work in an allied health area, but it's not specifically something where you're licensed or certified, feel free to talk to us and we can consider that on a case-by-case -case basis, um, depending on what you've done um, in terms of your work experience, other allied health. But we categorize volunteer work and other allied health in the same category for the same number of points. What's really important though, is that at the time of application, you do need to bring documentation on your organization's letterhead with an original signature, including all of the bullets that you see here. For example, we need to know essentially your name, when you started working or volunteering, what your status is. Are you a full-time or part-time employee? On average, the number of hours that you work per week, we can do the math on that. Some sites will include uh, only the hours worked per week, but we can see from your start date how many hours you may have. Some may say, you know, this particular employee has over a thousand hours and we certify that. Either one works, we just need to know specifically how many hours that you've worked in order to give you the points based on the different categories. 
Um, it also needs to include your specific job title, the department that you work in, um, your supervisor, manager, um, who's overseeing you and who's certifying these hours, uh, a quick, uh, you know, lay down of duties, including specifically your patient care interaction, as well as all of that information needs to be at, uh, given to us at the time of application. The third category is GPA. Now, this is the highest area of points. So we have students, for example, that might not have a 4.0 perfect GPA, and that's fine because you get up to 40 points as long as you have over a 3.5 GPA. And you could see the breakdown thereafter. So anything between a 3.0 to 3.49, you get 35 points, uh, and then all the way down. So if you have a 2.5 to 2.59, unfortunately, you won't get any points for this particular category, but that does not prevent you from applying. You are still eligible to apply. A lot of students um, ask me, well, what's the average amount of points that I need um, or what's the minimum amount of points that I need to even apply to the program? Technically, from what I've looked at, you could have literally one point and still be eligible for the program because, for example, if you had a 2.59 GPA um, and you get zero points and you don't get any health experience points or points for your bachelor's degree, you would get points for your English class because that is a prerequisite. And then you could have that amount of points and still be eligible for the program. And I'll explain that on the next uh, slide. The final category on this page is the withdrawal repeat rule. So again, as I mentioned, uh, minus three for any withdrawal for any of the science prerequisite courses. So you might have withdrawals for psychology or chemistry, uh, any other courses, a sociology, it doesn't really count. We're looking at withdrawals for science prerequisites, specifically anatomy, physiology, and microbiology. And again, for the repeats, we again only allow one repeat uh, in the anatomy, physiology, and microbiology within the last five years. Another thing to note too is some students uh, repeat courses for better grades. So they might have a C in anatomy, physiology, or micro, and they decide they want to retake one of those science courses for a better grade and they get an A. If that science course that you originally took is within the last five years, we will always take the first attempt. So to clarify, if you took anatomy and got a C, physiology and got an A, microbiology and got an A, and that's all within the last five years of your application, then you decided I want to take anatomy, you get an A in that, we are going to count the C in anatomy since that was your first original attempt, it was a passing grade, it, does, it counts as part of your science GPA, even though you repeated it, and even though we allow repeat, any passing grades will always look at the original GPA. If you have questions, let us know and we could talk to you about that more specifically. Okay, on to the next on the back page of the multi-criteria. So these are the point breakdowns for English, Nursing 17, and Nursing 36. So Nursing 17 and 36 is optional. If you do have those classes done before applying to the nursing program and you have grades of A, B, or C, you could see here that you can get points for that. So if, for example, if you got an A in nursing 17, you would get three points. If you didn't do any nursing 17 or 36 course, don't feel bad, not a problem. It doesn't count against you. You just don't get points for that section. I just essentially see this as a bonus area. English one, however, um, or an AP exam score of three, four, or five, that does count for points. So if you took English uh, composition, whether it's at SMC or any school, depending on the grade you get, A, B, or C, you'll get your points. So if you got an A, three points, B, two points, C, one point. So again, if you, for example, got a 2.5 GPA and you got a C in English one, you would get one point. You might not have points in any of the other sections. That's fine. You're still minimally eligible to apply to the program. Again, the more points you have, the more competitive that application would be. And considering all of the other students who are applying, they might have more points in different categories. So that's always something to consider. Completion of the required associate's degree relevant coursework. So what we mean here would be on that previous slide, the psychology 19, which is the developmental psych, 
the communication interpersonal class or the public speaking class, the social science group A, the math class, your humanities, global citizenship. So the more classes you have done in these general ed categories, the more points you'll have access to. If all of these classes are complete, the six that I just mentioned, six points will be awarded to you. You will be complete with everything. If you're missing one of the courses, four points. If you're missing two areas or more, two points. If you have a bachelor's degree from an accredited university or college in the U.S., you might be exempt from these associate's degree requirements because you have a bachelor's degree. Again, everything, um, every bachelor's degree is kind of unique. It needs to be accredited. So speak with us about that just so that we can confirm for you whether you will have points um, for your bachelor's degree uh, in addition to being exempt from any of these courses that I just mentioned here. Another area for bonus is life experience. So not everyone has, you know, any of these A through H areas that they identify with and that they would furnish for us at the time of application. That is okay. Not a problem. If you do feel, however, that you are a first generation college student and you would like points, then you would need to make sure that you complete the supporting documentation and provide that to us at the time of application. You don't get more points for having more than one category. You get three points maximum for any of these areas A through H. So for example, if you had, if you have low family income and you can provide proof to us that you receive financial aid, the California Promise Grant, the Board of Governors Fee Waiver, Cal Grant, Pal Grant, et cetera, then you would print that out and provide that to us at the time of application. If you needed to work, this applies specifically to employment during any of the anatomy, physiology, microbiology, prerequisite courses, even English. If you provide us a pay stub dated during the time you were doing any of the prerequisite courses and you give that to us at the time of application, you will then have access to three points under the life experience area. If you have questions, let us know and we could talk to you about each of these individual areas. Proficiency in a second language. So as long as you are proficient in speaking and or reading and writing for any language, uh, you can have up to two points here. So some students might say, you know, I'm pretty proficient in speaking, but I can't read or write. Not a problem. That means you would get one point for the speaking and no points for reading and writing. Some students will say, I can do all three. So in that case, you would get two points and you would disclose to us what language that you speak read or write. If you have questions, let us know and we could talk to you about that specifically. And then finally, the last area, the NLN PACS testing. So National League of Nursing PACS exam. This is an admissions assessment test that you would need to take before being um, eligible for the nursing program. So in addition to applying to the program with your prerequisites, English, Anatomy, Physiology, and Micro, if you meet minimum eligibility requirements, you know, your 2.5 GPA, your C or higher in a college level transferable English class, you have the GPA minimum, no repeats, all recent science courses. Um, if you meet that minimum eligibility, you will be invited to take the NLN PACS test. Based on your point breakdown up to 160, you will get points uh, based on your score. So 114 is the minimum passing score. The higher points that you get, the more points you will have for the multi-criteria. This is important simply because this is the second highest area of points after the science GPA. So I've seen students do extremely well and they're very prepared for the NLN PACS test and they may get a 133 or higher and, and they might edge out other students that might have, for example, lower GPAs uh, or not as many points in other categories because they did really well on the PACS test. We have different strategies and techniques to do well and how to prepare for the PACS, so we'll talk to you about that shortly. Okay, but before we get to the PACS, there are some key areas that all students need to meet these criteria in order to be eligible for the program. So of course you have to be in good without saying academic and progress standing, as I mentioned, you need a 114 on the NLN PACS admissions assessment test. You also need to meet minimal, minimum physical qualifications and essential functions. 
without going into this in too much detail, all students, uh, when you're accepted to the nursing program, you need to do physical, a physical examination with your physician. So based on that, you would need to get cleared um, that you meet these physical qualifications. You would also need to provide um, verification that you have your immunizations and your titers. This is not anything that you need to do before applying to the program. If you're accepted to the program, you will attend an orientation, and during that orientation, you will get more than enough information explaining to you how to go about doing your physical exam and all of your immunizations. I think the main takeaway on this page and what's most important are the last two sections um, with the checks, is that you need to have a negative criminal background check and a clear drug screening. And this will be required to update regularly throughout your the nursing clinicals that you go to. So for example, at the time of um, acceptance to the program, you'll do a criminal background check. That might be clear, but if anything were to happen during the course of your nursing program, you might need clearance from your clinical sites. You might be asked to do a urine test or a hair test. And depending on that facility, you need drug screening before you move on to any clinical rotation. So you do not pick your rotations. You do not, you know, show your preference for any particular site. They are assigned to you and your schedule can change every eight weeks. And because of the different clinical sites that you rotate to, just make sure that you stay safe, um, especially with the background check and the drug screening. You also need to have a valid social security or tax ID number. Uh, some clinical facilities don't accept the tax ID number. So this is important for employment here in California or in the US. So you need to have a social security number to be able to do your clinical rotations in a facility or at the hospital. Okay, in terms of the application process, so we typically accept applications to the nursing program twice a year during summer and winter. And this can vary completely depending on uh, in terms of the dates. So typically in summer, it's usually around July, August. In winter, <clears throat> it typically could be around January, February. You would be able to see when our application filing periods are updated on our website, or you can call us in counseling, or you can call the front desk, and we can give you more information as it gets closer to application season. You would sign up for an application workshop via your student portal on Coursera Connect. There you would be able to sign up for what we call an application workshop or application session. You would come in person to those application sessions. You would be prepared by bringing all of your supporting documentation. You would have all of your transcripts from every school and every college that you've attended sent to SMC's admissions office. Us as health science counselors will be able to see all of your transcripts on file to determine your eligibility for the program. We would then be able to factor in, have you met the prerequisites? Have you taken general education courses, whether it's outside of SMC or at the college? If you wanna have any of your prerequisites or courses that you've taken pre-evaluated um, and looked at just to determine if you've met minimum eligibility even before you apply, you can do that by scheduling an appointment with us and we can uh, view all of your documents beforehand. And we definitely recommend for you to sign up early to an application workshop. We might have three or four sessions throughout the week for uh, maybe three or four weeks. A lot of times students will wait to the very last minute and try to schedule one of the last application sessions. And because of that, they tend to fill up very quickly. Our earlier application sessions tend to be, um, I guess you could say less booked than the middle or the later end of the application cycle. So I encourage you, if you're simply eligible and you're ready, sign up for an early application workshop. There tends to sometimes be less students in those early application workshops. I mentioned already, you need to come prepared so you would bring your supporting documentation, which is very important. All of your verifications of health uh, experience, copies of your licensure certification cards, do supporting documentation for your life experience. So again, if you're bringing in pay stubs, photocopies of your uh, DD-214 if you're a veteran, uh, if you had difficult uh, challenges or family situations or circumstances that you want to 
write about, you would be bringing in all of that supporting documentation at the time of application. Important transcript information. So non-SMC official transcripts and AP College Board score reports from all colleges and universities are required to be on file with SMC admissions and records before applying. So ideally, our next application period typically would be in summer. So we would want to make sure that all of your application materials in terms of your transcripts are on file no later than the end of June. If you're going to be applying, for example, in winter, we'd want to make sure that all of your application um, transcripts um, are on file through SMC admissions no later than December 31st. So at the end of the year, if you're applying in winter, by I would say the end of the spring semester, if you're applying in summer. Foreign transcripts and university transcripts need to be evaluated and on file by those same deadlines if you have any foreign transcripts or evaluations on file. Another thing I want to mention that isn't um, specified here in this presentation is that we again accept twice per year. So if you're applying in winter, that would be for the fall cohort. If you're applying in summer, that would be for the spring cohort. And we typically accept 40 students each semester. So again, for the fall cohort, 40 new students coming in, and for the spring cohort, 40 new students coming in. Okay, so a little bit about the admissions assessment test. So <clears throat> the NLN PACS is uh, an admissions assessment test from the National League of Nursing. The NLN also does the NCLEX, which is the licensing exam that you would need to take after you earn your associate's degree to be a licensed professional nurse. So since the NLN does a pre-nursing admissions assessment test, this is what we require at SMC. At minimum, again, as I mentioned, you need a passing score of 114. Any student who takes the NLN PACS, you only are allowed one attempt if you have a passing score. So what I mean by that is if you pass, you cannot retake the NLN PACS for a better score. You can, however, retake the NLN PACS one time if you do not pass the first time around. So in other words, if you get a 113 or lower score, you are allowed to retest one more time. You would have to, however, meet with one of us, one of the health science counselors for something called a readiness plan contract to be eligible to retest the following application cycle at the earliest. Students are allowed one year to do their readiness plan contract. So some students will determine that they need more time to prepare to retest. They'll use their one full year. Some students find that their one semester preparation is adequate, and then they'll retest after finishing their readiness plan contract the next application cycle. And then you'll receive a letter regarding the dates to schedule a readiness plan um, and to meet with us to do that. So for any, for any reason, if you do not pass, we will be in communication with you automatically to let you know what your next steps are. And you can choose whether or not you would like to do your readiness plan if you would like to continue on and uh, make yourself eligible to retest for the program. Like our application season, testing takes place twice a year. So we typically do testing September, October, and March, April. So if you're, again, you're applying uh, in the winter for the fall cohort, you would then be testing around March-ish. And if you're applying for the spring cohort and you applied in, say, summer, then you would be testing around September or October-ish um, coming in for the spring cohort. We will always, when we invite you to take the NLN PACS, give you all of the information you need to register for this exam. It is free. It is hosted by the college. So all you need to do is receive your letter, sign up, and show up. Um, they're typically, again, in-person testing, so you would need to come to either the assessment center or the location that we specify in the letter for you. The exam covers very similar topics to the T's. I mean, it's pretty much identical, English, math, and science. However, just as a disclaimer, you might see topics like basic questions of earth science and physics. And I know typically students do not take these courses in order to prepare for the NLN PACs or the T's. So in that case, you might want to prepare for basic questions about ohms and electrons and things like that. But I know that it does not make or break a student um, if you're unable to answer those particular questions. 
What's important, though, is that you do prepare for English, math, and science, uh, especially for the, if English is a second language. There is vocabulary. There are reading comprehension sections. It's very much timed, so students tend to panic and run out of time. So we always say to prepare as thoroughly as possible uh, for the English section. Um, I've even, I, I'm personally not a nurse, but I've seen and heard from students that there are lots of words on there that you may not use in everyday language. So I think it's really important to, you know, get either a vocabulary app or prepare accordingly for some of the things you might see in the English section. Math is no higher than intermediate algebra. But again, if you haven't taken math in a long time, that's an area to brush up on. Science, um, you know, you've done anatomy, physiology, and micro in the recent years, so you should probably be fresh in that, but it doesn't hurt to study basic bio, some physics, chemistry, I think you'll see on there as well. There is a study guide available through the NLN, so you could actually purchase a review book, the Red Review Book, um, or you could actually internet search the NLN student store, and you could see the review book, and this is a, a link to the uh, website, but I know that's not really helpful here. So what I want to do is take you to NLN site this so that you could actually see what it would look like. So if you were to Google, and for me, I just entered into Google here, NLN PACS official study guide. You can see that you can purchase this review book if you want to. Um, you could buy it on Amazon, for example, new or used, and I believe you could even rent it on some sites. But I would definitely say you want to go here to this page and you can see all of the frequently asked questions in regards to the NLN PACS. As of, I believe, fall 2017, the NLN now allows students to take a practice exam and I highly recommend it. Some of the best scores I've seen, um, and this is anecdotally, but from students, they've said they've taken the practice exam. So if you're a nervous test taker, if nursing is very important to you and you want to make sure that you are as most competitive as possible, or if simply SMC is one of your first choices for nursing programs, simply because we do require the NLN PACS specifically and not the T's, you can actually prepare specifically for this test. So I highly suggest if you want to, to get the NLN PACS prep through the NLN specifically, uh, and you could take the timed test. And from what I've heard from students, because they're experimental questions, a lot of the questions are normed for nursing students. And what I mean by that is a lot of the questions have a health science focus. A lot of the answers are correct. It's just what's the best answer. And I know that could throw students off. A lot of the math questions are basic math calculations or equations, but because maybe there's context of like IVs, patients, a certain health situation, it might throw someone off and it might be very confusing. Um, so if you want to get a sneak peek of what this exam will look like uh, in terms of timing, the way the questions are worded, the sections, uh, that's when I highly suggest that this would be something you want to invest in. Again, nothing you're required to do, nothing you have to do. If you've already taken the T's already and you've done well on it, if you're a confident test taker, I'm sure you're just going to be fine. Uh, but again, if you're nervous or if you want to prepare more specifically, that's when I say that if you want to go to this PAX website, um, and download this material, you can. Okay, so a little bit about the nursing program. So our nursing program is four semesters. It is a full-time program, fall and spring. There are no classes at all during your winter and summer. You could see what the curriculum looks like on that brochure that I was showing you at the very beginning, that colorful brochure. It breaks down for you all of the classes in your first, second, third, and fourth semesters of the program. What's different, however, with the nursing program is that your classes will change every eight weeks. So for example, in the first, second, and fourth semesters of the nursing program, every eight weeks, you might have, for example, a new class and a new clinical section. So you could have your first semester nursing one, your nursing 1L, which is your nursing concepts lab, your clinical section, so to speak, for the first eight weeks. And then in the second eight weeks, you'll begin nursing two, you'll do a new clinical and a new uh, uh, theory class. Then when you start your second semester, you'll start nursing three, first eight weeks, nursing four, second eight weeks. And nursing three might be attached to one clinical section, nursing four, you might rotate to a different site. And you could see here all of the different partners. 
During the third semester of the program, you'll have, we'll actually have four week courses and eight week courses combined. Uh, and this is when you'll be in your specialty courses, like you'll have, for example, um, your maternal newborn course, your pediatrics, your adult health class. Some of our clinical partners are included here. You can see Kaiser, UCLA Harbor, UCLA Santa Monica, the Veterans Center. Um, so you do not unfortunately get to choose which site you want to rotate to. Uh, our program will coordinate for you all of the di different clinical rotations you will have, um, but I can guarantee you you'll have a very rich, robust experience um, rotating to the different partners that we have. Strong NCLEX pass rates. So here on this website, rn.ca.gov, not only can you see the pass rates for all nursing programs, including our own, um, but I encourage you to see the pass rates for every single program that you're considering applying to. Um, usually high pass rates indicate that, you know, students are very well prepared to take the NCLEX, which is the licensing exam that you need to take in order to work as a professional nurse. There's definitely very important qualities for nurses. Um, critical thinking skills, communication skills, compassion. You can read this slide. I know that every single one of these are extremely important. From our nursing faculty, um, I know that they've expressed you know, communication skills, I mean, is one example of the skill sets that you would need because you're going to be interfacing not only with your colleagues and other um, nursing students, but with other professional nurses on the floor, with doctors, with patients, potentially patient families. So you need to be able to clearly communicate and give reports um, to the next nurse coming on shift. Um, you also need to communicate clearly, you know, depending on uh, what the patient's um, language is, what, um, you know, and, and then also considering diversity and cultural competency. So there's a lot of things that one needs to consider. Also being able to multitask, you know, depending on what unit you're in, you might be, you know, doing multiple things all at once. Like if you're in a trauma setting or if you're working in the ER, for example, critical thinking skills and being detail oriented is very important. You'd be a lot of times doing, you know, charting and things like that. Emotional stability as well. Um, I think it goes without saying that a lot of times people go into nursing because they're compassionate, they want to help, um, they want to be part of the healthcare system and provide care. Um, but a lot of times, you know, depending on the unit that you work in and the facility, you might take not necessarily work home with you, but if you're, you know, any, a compassionate person, you might be seeing suffering and emergencies and other stressors, death and dying. And I think that's the reality of being in healthcare, working as a nurse. So you'd have to make sure that you could essentially come home and be able to hopefully let some of that go or be able to process some of the things that you see um, on your sites organizational skills, physical stamina. A lot of times you're working at minimum a 12 hour shift that doesn't include, you know, staying after a little bit to um, give reports to other nurses, to connect with other shifts. Um, you might have other things that you need to follow up on. And a lot of times standing on your feet and having good knees and a good back, um, that's going to be very taxing on the body all day. So I know that you guys can read this, so I don't want to exhaust this too much in detail, but if you have any concerns about any of these important qualities, feel free to talk to us um, in, a, in a counseling appointment and we can break down this for you in much more detail. In terms of career exploration, I know a lot of you might be absolutely certain that nursing is a fit for you, but in case that you are not, um, you could take a class called Counseling 12, which is a career planning class, and you could explore all of the different facets to healthcare. Honestly, and I'm not exaggerating, there are tons of different health specialties out there. There's hundreds of nursing specialties, uh, let alone other allied health pathways. I mean, off the top of my head, I could think of 20 different other pathways, you know, respiratory care, uh, radiologic technology. Um, you could even go into speech language pathology, physician's assistant. Um, I mean, the list goes on. So if nursing isn't necessarily a fit for you, that's okay, just because you could explore other allied health areas. And that's important to consider. Is direct patient care something you want to do? 
is diagnostic services or working in a lab or in a health setting important to you, but not necessarily one-on-one -on -one with patients. So that's something that we as counselors can talk to you about in terms of career exploration. You could also participate um, in the Pre-Health Association Club, the Nursing Association, um, the Student Nurse Association is wonderful, so we always suggest that. Volunteer work, I can't stress that enough. Before you, you know, delve deep into taking a lot of these nursing prerequisite courses, just because they're very rigorous and they could be very stressful, you want to make sure nursing or health is a good fit for you. So if you even volunteer, and what you see here in bold, like UCLA, care extenders or the cope health scholar program or the cedar sinai nurse transformative care at bedside program all excellent programs even kaiser has volunteer programs and if you want to see if the environment is a good fit for you a lot of times students volunteer and they realize you know i don't like the setting i don't like the lighting i don't like the smells the sounds the fluids all of that stuff, I think when they're actually in that setting, they may realize it energizes them and excites them and they cannot wait to work in a field like this. And for others, you know, it might dissuade them and that's okay, but it's something that you need to realistically see for yourself if it's something you want to do. And again, all part of the career exploration process that we could speak to you guys about. Other courses that you could actually take at SMC in addition to the anatomy, phys, and micro, is if you wanted to get a sense of whether or not, you know, health, the health field is a good fit. You can take um, medical terminology or respiratory therapy or intro to occupational therapy. There's also non-credit courses, like we have a gerontology certificate, for example. Um, that's very important in this current state. So if you want to talk about other health, uh, allied health uh, options to take in addition to your prerequisite courses or to supplement what you're already taking, speak to us in counseling and we could talk to you about that. Transfer. So specifically in the nursing program, we're really going to be advising you more about the associate's degree and our registered nursing program. Um, but we do have general counseling and transfer services available to you if you're if someone is interested specifically in maybe just going directly and getting their BSN degrees, uh, maybe you already have a bachelor's degree in another subject uh, and you're thinking about going back to school and you want to earn your BSN, so you want to earn um, a nursing degree, perhaps without doing your associate's degree. So if that's the case, we do have um, transfer counseling services. And we could also do general ed evaluations for you if you've attended other campuses. And that's kind of the last piece of information that I wanted to share with you guys. So let me actually share back to this screen here. So I know there was a lot of information today. Thank you for sticking around for over an hour today. But if you have questions, again, I want to emphasize we are here and available for you five days a week. There's four health science counselors. You could schedule an appointment virtually to speak with us, uh, and we're more than happy to answer any of your questions about the program. So thanks so much for tuning in.